We have with us Noah Tishby, prominent Israeli actress and producer, and um, who's uh, well known for all of her uh, performing performances in Israeli TV and films, and for bringing the Tipul in treatment to HBO in the U.S. And we also have Lior Sasson, Israel's cultural attaché at the Israeli consulate in Los Angeles, and uh, also a former uh, producer of content in Israel, and Naomi Light, who is uh, assistant director for research and publications at the USC Center on Public Diplomacy, and uh, the intellectual political heavyweight in our bina, inner circle. Um, so let me just uh, read something from the director. Um, and uh, did you guys, you're on? Yeah. The director, uh, the co-director, Kirk Simon, um, was asked, um, how is Israel portrayed in the film? And I don't believe either of the two directors of the film are, are Jewish uh, and did not come to this with any particular agenda. In fact, I think they were in Israel in the beginning to make a documentary on another subject that didn't work out. And this school caught their eye. It was in the news. And they uh, asked for permission. And, and it was granted. And they began to make this film. So uh, Kirk said, there have been numerous screenings of the film in New York and LA and at film, festival, film festivals around the US. At every screening, people comment that what is shown in the film is an Israel they were unfamiliar with that the film opened their eyes to something they had no idea existed. So I feel proud to help present a fuller picture of what life in Israel is. Um, I feel that our Academy Award will help get the necessary attention so that we can help the children of undocumented workers stay in Israel. And I believe the task the school is facing deserves global recognition. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about, about that toward the end of our discussion. I want to kind of um, just engage your, your reactions uh, on, on a personal level and also just uh, coming from your professions. Uh, so, uh, Lior, let's start with you. Um, you know, how do you see this film from a government perspective as a, as a console, as, as a cultural console? Um, talk about the power of the image and, and how do you think this film presents Israel? Well, I think this, first of all, is a, a, in, in a sense, it's a humanitarian film. It shows a, a, some, an aspect in Israeli society that we know about uh, in a sense of integration and the fact that it's an immigration sick country. It's a country that is built on immigration. So this is not, it's not foreign for us, I think, as Israelis to see that. Uh, in a sense, you know, we, we have been promoting Israeli films which are good for the state of Israel in a sense, and also who, who criticize the state of Israel. And you know, in the last uh, two other uh, Oscars entries, uh, Once with Bashir, which is an amazing film, uh, and uh, Ajami, uh, also an amazing film, and before the year before, are not easy films as to, to portray the perfect image of Israel. Um, yet this film, which is done by American producers that come from a different perspective, show maybe another thing that us Israelis have been hard for us to, to present in a sense. So that's. It's a wonderful film, I think, in, in a sense, and, and it shows something that is very unique in the Israeli society and uh, in this school specifically. Sure. Yeah. Okay. You know, we all in this room have our own political views that we might not all agree on what Israel should do in its governmental policies, but I think we can all agree that Israel has a little bit of a PR problem. And so one of the things we want to talk about tonight, you know, is that, you know, and our PR problem leads us to be judged and, and negotiated with by a double standard by, by much of the world, and, and that we can do a much better job of showing who we are, what the reality is of living in Israel, um, and the great accomplishments of Israeli people, you know, as well as the sort of the choices that Israelis have to make individually and collectively. So um, with that in mind, um, Noah, as a, a filmmaker and, and a producer and an actress and a model, somebody who's very visible and... and um, visibly Israeli around the world, uh, how do you feel about when you see a film like this, how it sort of uh, gives you some context? Well, first of all, I'm uh, really happy you approached uh, Lior to start with, because I'm speechless. I haven't seen this film. It's the first time I'm seeing it, and uh, I heard about it, and I know about the school, and again, I know about um, Israel's uh, humanitarian actions, um, but I, <laughs> I just came up here a little a little shaky because uh, what I really want to do is go back to Israel and just adopt all of them. <laughs> <laughs> just come for Shabbat, all of you. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I think that um, as an Israeli American and someone that travels a lot and work in both cultures uh, and have been for a very long time, um, the Israel that we know, and I'm assuming most of us in the audience know, and the Israel that is portrayed outside in the media couldn't be more different and it couldn't be more frustrating to me as a person, as, a, as an Israeli-American. And um, I think that what's happening right now with panels like this, and I know that I'm working on stuff and I know Lior is working on stuff and I know other people who are working on um, various types of ways to alter that perception, um, I think this film is priceless, absolutely priceless. Um, it, this is something that we know and we're aware of. 
but to have it be shown this way is I, I don't think Israel could have asked for anything better and we'll talk about you know we'll talk about what what can be done a little later but obviously this is one of the best it's not even a, a PR spin yeah. it's just showing the reality and, and using kids to show it which is you know extremely powerful yeah it gives I mean, Israel this credibility that this film was not done by an Israeli was not done by a Jew um, really gives the credibility that it would have maybe lacked if it had come from the inside so yeah. I think that's one really big benefit to Israel's image, um, Israel in the media. It really, um, it really shows the strength. And also, um, I actually think the Ulpan teachers really, um, I actually have the privilege of studying in Ulpan in Israel. So I really relate to these teachers because I think every Ulpan teacher is just like every single one of those women um, on the screen. And I really do. <laughs> just that Israeli energy of women. No, you hide the name. Come on. You can hide the name. It's okay. Come. I, exactly. And why why so, aren't they running the country? <laughs> and I, I think they give an incredibly warm, compassionate face for Israel that most people don't, don't get to see. Um, so that's really nice. And it's, it's incredible because within Israel, the father saying, I want to live in a peaceful place. Israel. So, I mean, yeah. it's, 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 it's all a point of view. It's yeah. exactly. It's all a point of view where you're coming from um, and where you want to go. And so I, I think that was the, the biggest impact for, for the film. So, so let me introduce this notion then to all of you uh, of nation branding and how we need to do, we were discussing in the, in the Binah sort of steering committee when we all looked at this film, we need to do it in two ways. On the one hand, we need to play the game as it is, the PR game, and just be better at it. And... Um, you know, uh, on multiple levels, not sort of complain that the rules are unfair, but just, but just, and I'll, and I'll talk more about what I mean by that, but at the same time, also offer a counter narrative, a different narrative to tell a different story. So we can sort of talk about the story that's being told and try to, and try to address that, as well as present our own version, what we want to see and what we know is also true. You know, we know the realities are very complex in Israel, but this is one that just simply is, you know, utterly new to most people. So, how do we do both of those things at once, you know, using culture, using film, using the power of the image? Well, I think it's, uh, it's basically, well, you know, when, when talking about the situation in Israel or, the, or the, the Middle East, in a sense, it's like a battle of stories, in a sense. You know, my brother uses this uh, term, uh, a war between stories. You have different stories that are trying to dominate each other and telling which one came first or which one is better. Yeah. Um, in a sense, I think it's a matter of telling the story that uh, we feel that is, that is right to history and, and what is it basically our notion of why are we there and why are we are living there and what is the state of Israel, the true essence of the state of Israel as a home for the Jews coming from a very, very difficult and hard history and going back thousands of years before. Actions. I also and think, is there like a defeatism sometimes in that they're gonna, the world's going to think what it wants to anyway, that's too big of a tie to... Look, Israel on some level, I think They're against that, us no matter what. Yeah, and I think that it's time on a general context to recreate the story of the Jewish people because, I mean, when you walk around on some sort of like, look, I'm going to be a little blah blah here, right? I'm going to be a little ethereal. But when you walk around thinking you're the victim all the time, as a nation, we're kind of like, well, they hate us, right? It's a, and on some weird level, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think that we can, I mean, okay, enough with that. Yes, everything happened and it's all true. As an Israeli nation that's only been around for 60 somewhat years, what kind of a narrative are we creating for ourselves that isn't based on because of the Holocaust and because of the thing? And we go back all the way to a stew of lentil in the Bible. Like, really? That's why we're fighting? I mean, enough, right? So... Yes, there's a sense in the Israeli people and in us, all of us, right, of, of a victim. But I think we can actually recreate that as creative people and creative community and on a political level and just the new generation can actually create something new here. We also have to play in the rules that we know about, uh, you know, about politics, about a country's interests. You know, at the end of the day, it's all about interests. Mm -hmm. what, what countries really want to achieve yeah. you know, from well, any kind of public... Uh, occurrence. I, th I think what we can agree on is that we want self-determination and, and as any nation does uh, and, the, and the right to do that and to have you know our values respected and uh, to have um, you know, the, the full story being told. So, so Naomi, I know, uh, put this in the context of this concept of soft power. Maybe tell everybody a little bit of what that is. This is what you do. You get your exactly. You know, so I'm going to kind of, of pull us back from ethereal and from kind of emotional to this academic level. So you're ethereal, I'm academic. We can play those roles tonight. Um, and so what actually everybody's calling PR for Israel is actually what countries call public diplomacy, which is what I, I, um, I work in, I practice, I try to inform. And so you take the concept of public diplomacy, which is the way a government 
can interact with a foreign public. So the way Israel um, needs to relate to the world um, is through, you know, this is the Israeli government, and what is the Israeli government or the Israeli people saying to foreign publics, not to other governments, but to populations. So why we have this media image problem, why, why a lot of foreign publics, the US public, by the way, is 70% in favor of Israel as a whole, very supportive of Israel. So it's not really the US public that has to be targeted by the Israeli government with its public diplomacy, but to kind of the rest of the world. And so I wanted to start with that public diplomacy because everything falls from, from there and uh, PR is a little different. So in terms of soft power, soft power, um, which is what we're talking about when we say Israel's beaches and its, its, its um, culture and its ulpan teachers and its food is the power, to the power to attract. So soft power is the ability for a country to, to attract other countries to be like it, to do what it wants because it sees a country that is attractive. We want to be like them because they have amazing high tech or because they have great tourism or because they have a great language system, you know, all these different things. So that's kind of the, the overview of soft power. Um, and I think Israel doesn't know how to use soft power in a, in a productive way. So um, kind of the best way um, to use soft power. But, so just to interrupt yeah. you for one second. So is this film a good example of media image soft power in, in you know? Well, it doesn't come from the government. So, um, but, but being supported by the government and, and demonstrating Israel as, as a, um, a, in a different light than most other things coming through the media, it, um, it gives Israel soft power. I mean, here, here's a guy exactly. named Mohammed who is mm -hmm. getting the best that Israel has to offer, you know, in terms of uh, teaching and, uh, um, you know, place a safe place and mm -hmm. support and food and clothing and, you know, and love, really. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is, you know, love and tolerance. So exactly. um, I would think that that, that, that I, I just want to fixate on what you said about it's our values. You know, we mm -hmm. want to show our values and attract people to us mm -hmm. based on our values, make them want to be like us. Exactly. And so, yes, this film is great for Israel's soft power. The problem is uh, kind of multifaceted, and, and when you go from there, so you've got this great soft power tool, this film, um, but when you expand it to the rest of the context that Israel's living in, in the Middle East, in, in its relationships with other countries, in the media, then you get all these different points of conflict. And so, and so while you take that soft power, you can't, you know, public diplomacy practitioners say for every country, for every situation, you cannot cover up certain actions with good public diplomacy. You can have the best nation brand, you can have the best soft power, but, but if you do something that the public doesn't like, it's gonna hurt your credibility. So that's kind of how that balance works. And so you can, you can see why Israel's soft power isn't going to get that far because there's all these different other contexts that Israel's soft power lies in. Mm, yeah, I, I, I don't understand how it's possible that Israel is a country that is a leader in so many aspects, and yet in this particular area, as a government and as a, as a, as a nation, we fail so miserably. And from Israel, you don't actually realize how bad it is, like how bad our PR is mm -hmm. and how problematic that is on, on a, on a, from a safety point of view. Like, mm -hmm. it's actually, that's actually a real imminent danger yes. to the country. Because if you think about it, the... Um, the, oh, the countries that have recently, in the past, you know, 60 somewhat years, they've actually, governments that toppled, toppled because of political shifts within or from without. It's, whether it's Czechoslovakia or the Soviet Union or South Africa or whatever it was, like, Israel's not under real, unless Iran gets the bomb, which it won because the mysterious worm, computer yeah, worm, Stuxnet. is duplicating itself <laughs> inside the, uh, the, the, the plant, which mm -hmm. is very odd. Um, <laughs> well, have you ever been in a situation? Uh, a a worm with a yarmulke. <laughs> um, maybe, I don't know. So what I'm, sa what I'm saying yeah. is, unless that happens, Israel's not under a real right. threat, real danger. Israel's a very strong army. We're a very, very strong country. But what's happening right now in the world, that in America, Israel's still being supported, but everywhere else in the world, they just did a survey. Israel won fourth from the bottom mm -hmm. in terms of approval, nation's approval, before South, like right after South Korea, Iran, mm -hmm. and, and uh, um, one other country, one other lovely yeah. country, mm -hmm. and then Israel. Myanmar. So something like that, <laughs> yeah. right? And for, I, I don't, I'm not sure Israelis, that us as Israelis within Israel realize how dangerous, dangerous. that actually so is. So you travel. Uh, what, since I've been here, I saw a few times, like, 
let's say the British would decide to do their national day. No problem. You know, by the way, the next they're going to do a Brit week, right. which will be like all over the city and, and everything, and you'll get cooperation from every organization. Try to do Israel Independence Day. It's difficult. It's not, it's not, uh, a, a, if I approach to, let's say, celebrities or people or from the industry, most likely, even if they've been to Israel, they're not going to come yeah. and identify themselves here with us. So, I mean, there's something in the essence uh, of the image that Israel is portraying that is difficult. So, so as, how do you change it? As a, you know, as a cultural consult, put yourself for a moment that you're, let's say, in the Israeli film fund. If they transfer you there, you're sitting there, you read scripts that want Israeli money, Waltz with Bashir, Ajami, um, Lebanon, you know, it must be a pretty depressing day to, to work in the, you know, in the Israeli film fund. To, to, and, and Israel gives money to these films which put out, let's say, an ambivalent uh, uh, portrait of, of Israel, perhaps, some people say even negative. Um, what's the, um, what does that say about us and our values? And, I, and I'm saying that in a positive way, but go ahead, sorry. I actually, I had a lot of arguments with a lot of people about this because um, I think Whilst with Bashir is one of the best films Ever not like just an Israeli, like it completely recreated a film. Like it's a completely paradigm, complete paradigm shift. And I think that it's even though it's a very difficult film to watch, I think that it's actually a good film to, for Israel on on a certain level because it shows freedom of speech. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of so it too, and I wasn't meaning to. In sort that, of yeah, in that sense, no, it shows something that isn't that that isn't that positive, but that's what Israel's about, yeah. communication. The best public diplomacy is being self-critical, is acknowledging yeah. your faults yeah. and accepting them and showing them to the world because it gives you credibility yeah. that you wouldn't otherwise can and have. It, it can and it cannot also. It can also it's, it's, hurt. It's both ways because yes. in a sense, in a sense you, can, you, you see sometimes that people can say, look, if they're saying something like that about themselves, we are definitely right. So. So it can be used in both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as far as the film fund, uh, the people are in the film fund are judging the scripts according to professional uh, abilities. They're looking at the script in the way, if it's a good film, like creatively is it a good film? And if it is, they green light it. Yeah. So, and in a sense, that's why the Israeli films are so good. So we cannot say that uh, we're not doing propaganda films. We're doing great films because they're just great. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're going in this process of really talented people who approve them and then execute them in the best manner. Um, I don't, they, in none of the issues, it's about content. It's never about content. It's about how good the film or the project is. And in that sense, I'm really happy that Israel has a clean uh, sense of, of, of presenting it. Now, as a diplomat afterwards to deal with it, yeah, I mean, there, it's, it's not easy to, to see a film that is, is criticizing Israel. And there's a lot of people, and there's a big argument about Israel. Should we criticize ourselves outside or should we leave it inside? I mean, now, Israelis are very criticizing inside. I'm, I always say dirty laundry inside. Inside, yeah. I mean, and, but on the other hand, if the film goes and be nominated to the Oscars, everybody's waving the flags. So I mean, that's the duality of, of using culture as a diplomatic, uh, as a public diplomacy tool. Mm -hmm. And you have to, that's part of the game in a sense. It's not the Ministry of Tourism who would show that soft power of, of a beautiful beach and beautiful people playing matkot, you know, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in a sense. But I mean, and, and that's the beauty about this film, I think, that it's done by people from the outside who can say, but, because if it was an Israeli film, uh, I'm not sure it would be, I'm 99.9% .9 that it wouldn't be even nominated for the Oscars. Mm -hmm. I, 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 that's my sense. I mean, uh, it, it would have been difficult to, to, to show it. I mean, in a First, sense. So. You're absolutely right. It's challenging to watch both Ajami before and, and Walsh with Bashir, right? However, I think the advantages of it are, th they surpass the disadvantages. Yes, they may cause people to feel uncomfortable and to think differently about Israel, but what we need to think about is what else are we putting out there and not stop or think that it's even possible or required to stop self-criticism and art because it doesn't look good. When I say dirty laundry inside, what I meant was I personally criticize Israel in Israel. Okay, outside, I'm like, we're awesome. Okay? Inside, I say what I want to say to my friends and family and media and whatever, right? So that's what I meant. That's why Israel is different to its neighbors, all right? We live in a really tough neighborhood in which you're not allowed to say anything, and look what's happening now. I think bring out all discussions, all of them. It's just that we need to be more active in putting out the positive. That's why we're not Syria or Afghanistan or Iran or Iraq or any of these places where you can't speak and you can't create anything. So as uncomfortable as it is for someone, and I, I acknowledge you and I, I thank you for all your work with APAC and with everything, it's all great. We need to actually think of what else are we putting out there and realize that Israel, that's a discussion. It's a part of a democratic state, the only real democ democracy and in that I, region. And I agree with Noah completely, and I'm not saying that these movies should be the number one soft power for Israel. No, no. not at all. There no. should be 
many, many, many other things. So but, again, the cover of Sports Illustrated needs to be exactly. there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if this was Australian, we would be everywhere saying, hey, Glenn Shane is the best thing in the world. So why aren't we doing that? You know, we're in the American TV and Israeli TV. Why aren't we on Australian TV, English TV, Excellent. every other like, mm -hmm. yeah. Great question. We've got this amazing product, let's get it out there. Mm. Well, I think you're right, but this, in, in this sense, you have to, and that's one of the problems. You know, another film, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer it, but another film that was nominated, well, actually was shortlisted, was Precious Life, a, a documentary, oh, uh, yeah. an amazing, amazing. documentary, um, which I really thought we had a good chance of getting it to the nomination which also tells a humanitarian aspect of this conflict. Those of you who don't know, it's a, it's also, it's a film that was also by HBO, bought by HBO. It tells a story about a Palestinian child uh, from Gaza that has been treated in the Soroka um, Medical uh, Hospital. It's yeah. an Israeli film, yeah. Amazing. Um, Are you saying, wow. And, you know, when it was f top 15, the producer told me that uh, we wasn't sure that he wants us to push it forward, in a sense. And I understand him. I understand him because at the end of the day, you want to show that the film is working by itself and not propelled by a government or by any big, you know, people don't like governments in general. You know, they don't like governments pushing and, and doing something like that. So, I mean, for us, I think that the best product would be something, a film that people relate to, connect to, and then push it themselves in a sense. So, I, yeah, sorry. I think that. Uh, you're, you're asking, it's a great question, like what is the government doing? The question is the government is buying more F-15s. We're that's doing what, the sequel. Or, <laughs> no, <laughs> but that's the Israeli government, and f rightfully so, it's, uh, it's not that I don't understand where they're coming from, but it is not on the agenda as much as it should be, again, because I don't think from within Israel the PR problem translates to a real threat that translates to, oh crap, we need to do something about it. Like we need to utilize everything good. So I actually think that's super important. There are a lot of Israelis with a lot of achievements around the world, and the government doesn't need to be the front. The government can use people that aren't in the government so that's, to that's push it forward. Exactly. People like whoever, how much like your, us. How much of your job is doing that? Is trying to get other people to push forward culturally? A lot, a lot. And and that's the thing. That's the key. The key element is not to bring here a show and pay for the show and bring the people to come and show. But if somebody, if like UCLA Live or Lachman or whatever it is, takes an Israeli show and promote it to other people, that's that's the gold for us as far as, as what we do. But I agree with you. In a sense, let's say if there was a big fund to help promote the films, this film and, and Precious mm -hmm. Life and other films, yeah, it would help, you know? Yeah. But this, this, it's a different it's a strategy changing sure. and sure. it's a different concept of the government. And I'm not sure that there is even an office that will be able to handle it right now the way it's structured. Mm -hmm. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs handles and promote culture in a, in, as related to Hasbara, what we call public diplomacy. Ministry of uh, Education and Culture promotes Israeli culture inside the country. Uh, I wish there was by arts or, or like an institute that will push Israeli art outside, but... Hello, uh, Stuart. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so one, one first problem, just with, really quick, with Israeli public diplomacy, Hasbara. Israel should not use the word Hasbara. You, yeah. Most of you know Hasbara yeah. means to explain. Explain, explain. when you're now, doing something bad. The key to the yeah. key to <laughs> Let me explain. explain. Hang on a second. It's <laughs> not explaining, but first listening to your audiences and then sharing and having a two-way communication and dialogue. And Israel is really bad at listening and having a dialogue. And unfortunately... What are you talking about? <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, no, 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 let me tell you. No, 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 no. So, but part of public diplomacy is culture. And, and the Israeli Foreign Ministry should have a public diplomacy department that has culture incorporated into it. It has. Um, you know, but you just said that there's no film or there's no arts. It, it has, and every time, let's say that we did sponsor the film and we did help promote the film, or we did create these screenings for it, and we did push it. I mean, but it's not in a level of of uh, the Australian HBO government, or the, yeah, or Australian mm -hmm. government, or English, or whatever it is that to push really, you need PR money. You need yeah. you need mm -hmm. money. To me, I think the issue is as, as a people come up with a simplified narrative that people can understand without having to take 30 minutes to describe, all right, well, here's what happened. <laughs> fair, fair enough. I mean, we need to have them on multiple levels, and we so, also need them on the simpler, more direct emotional level, the level of images, and so that is something we wanted to talk about, as well as the more complex, uh, expounded ones. We do need, uh, so go ahead. 
I, I, I was just going to answer the joke because now we're going to give you the 45 minutes answer as to how to make that <laughs> short yeah. thing. Yeah. You're right, is what I'm going to say. You can still download You're right. 30 second sound bite to give to people. I'm in. I don't even have that. I have an with idea. the Holocaust and the thing in the 2,000 years ago and the thing with the thing, you see them in the ground and we just need to be there. And 3,000 years ago. And then they have, it's very simple, it's true, it's very simple. What is about. But that word, mm. very powerful narrative that wasn't around when I was a kid. Yeah. Suddenly, a few years ago, what Just that? Does everyone hear Hell what Noah said? Nakba. Have you heard the word Nakba? The catastrophe, catastrophe, Arabic for catastrophe, which now very never... strong narrative. The Nakba. But we don't any longer have to explain why we need to be in Israel anymore. We make this mistake. You know, the Arab world knows we exist. They're ready to recognize us. Conditions, of course. But, but, you know, we don't have to still fight to, to explain why Depends we should be in this. Yeah, exactly. We have ask. to start. There are people in Gaza which would disagree. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. There are a couple of people in the around the Middle East that would. I would say the, the, major, the majority will. I think that, I think that, uh, I heard the hum. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I think that technically, I think it's true. Here's, the, here's what I think, right? I think she's actually right. Even though there are a lot of people in the Middle East that would disagree. Tough. All right? So the general agreement, I, th I think you're right, and I think you're, you're also wrong, obviously. I heard something this morning, I haven't actually verified it, so I'm not sure it's true, but Air Egypt put out new maps yeah. of the Middle East, oh, in which Israel doesn't exist at all. Really? Jordan just continues all the way to the ocean. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> that's fantastic, and that's Air Egypt. That's awesome. I wonder what Air Libya would put out there. Okay. So that's what Israel, I think that's a point of view in which Israel needs to come from. Not that it's the truth or it's not the truth. That would be a point of view that is productive and creative rather than, exactly. oh my god, that's, they want to kill us and they want, yeah, they, that's some of them want to kill us, but then again, there are a, some people want to kill other people. That's right? what I'm saying. So, so we have to, as a point of view of creating a narrative, exactly. that's the point of view we need to come from. Not that people, think, not that it's the truth or not. Exactly. So, Thank you. Any thoughts? You're so welcome. just before we take more about the gentleman's <laughs> question about simplified, emotional, visual, you know, not as complex. I think it's a matter of, uh, in, in a yes. sense, you know, action reaction. You have to tell the story, and, and part of the thing is that if you, s if you see part of the story, like, let's say if I, if I go and see a scene, and then I see, um, I don't know, um, a soldier kill a woman, then I obviously identify with a woman who was just shot. But if I do rewind, well, so context, context, context. Then I show, yeah, and then I show that this woman has killed this, this soldier brother, and then I immediately understand emotionally, and that's the that's the thing is to connect the people to the emotional element to it. So I wanted to give you an answer, but it's, it's the answer is yes, difficult. you're right, and it needs to be done in a very clear and concise kind of manner, from within, high above, all the way down. You're absolutely right. I have an answer. I, I, I wish I, I could call you as well right now and be like, "Israel, awesome." We were all know we were right. Question. Nobody ever comes up with True. Let's have another question. Let's go back to what can we do. Yeah. And I think what we can do is what Bina is doing right now. Make, bring more of these kind of movies, bring Precious Life, show it, and everybody in this room next time should bring their friends. And this is how we can actually change the attitude. Ilana, you're also happen. hardcore soft, soft power, <laughs> by the way. I mean, you're soft, awesome. <laughs> soft power, that's the only thing we can do. And I think it's the responsibility of each Israeli and anyone who already knows to bring and spread the word. That's the only way we can do it. Because explaining is apologizing, and I don't think there is any way we should apologize for something that is naturally ours, which is the right to live. So I, what's I would, it true? I would take it one step further, that each one of us should bring an American or somebody that doesn't know what to do. 100%. Here we all understand the story. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there's already, they should use the refugees and people who move to Israel as advocates for Israel. Because when they think of Israelis, they see, they see <laughs> just like, you know, You're a Caucasian. And like, being Caucasian, like, the world sees Caucasians as wealthy, affluent, we don't have any problems, it's the minority. And so the Jews aren't the minorities anymore. It's, you know, people, uh, refugees from, from Sudan, all these stories that we've just seen. So having people like... Like, like a guy named Muhammad uh, speaking Muhammad. well about Israel. Is like true, yeah, true. true. Again, that's, that you're, yes, yeah, absolutely. The, 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 the issue with it is you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that if these uh, refugees and these kids grow up and then end up leaving Israel and starting a life somewhere else, they will always be naturally obsessed with Israel. They don't even need to be used. Right. The problem that's arrives when they get kicked out. Citizenship. Yeah. <laughs> that's that, that's the and, problem and with like the actors of the PR. Are, are busy just some of them making get, a living. And, yeah. You know, and, and oh, that's a good question. All right. A lot of great <laughs> questions here. <laughs> Go ahead. Ability to both 
both hug and wrestle with Israel, to both love it and be able to view it through the critical lens of what it is, that it is still this amazing, but developing country, and to have a sense of empathy that, yes, it can be this land of milk and honey, but on the ground, it is what it is, and it's still becoming. It's still in the sense of becoming. Mm -hmm. And we need to create this sense to ourselves. I think we have that more. Do you not feel that we have that? I mean, yes, in this room, yeah. there are plenty of, that, yeah, that of don't. Jews today that feel disconnected from Israel. Mm -hmm. That's, it's that's not, so true. It's not just the rest of the world. It's American Jews. And yeah. we need to start thinking locally as well as globally about our relationship to Israel and, and our education. That's why pub, uh, Birthright Israel Taglit is actually one of the best public diplomacy campaigns from ever, an academic ever, standpoint ever, even best. that any country could do <laughs> because you're targeting okay. your natural audience. You're targeting the diasporic Jewish community to come and learn about Israel and come back and come back again. And the only way you're going to get that complex narrative that you want to hear as an American Jew is by going to Israel and, and really experience it. Not just for 10 days. I'm, I'm talking longer because that just scratches the surface. But really, but... But you know, birthright gives that taste, that desire to, oh, I want to go back and learn more. And I think continuing to fund birthright, all of us volunteering and funding birthright, and it's not a birthright ad right now, but I really believe that it's a very, very great well, tool for, for Yeah, I'm completely not involved with birthright, and I still, I, think, I talk about this all the time, so it is one of the most effective mm -hmm. things that Israel can do. And not to toot our, our own horn, but just as an organization, I think yeah. we aren't told by our funders what to do or what to say or what to show, and we naturally have our own different opinions and respect those, but you know, we are able to just by uh, putting on cultural events and by having intellectual discussions, you know, show our values, you know, in a way within our own sort of community and hope to attract like-minded people. So, all right, Barack, you had your hand up. I think Israel, in, in that sense, I'm not sure now, you know better than me because you're more in the business there, but we, I think that we are, we are not handling the news right. I mean, no, let's, say, we're not. let's say, for example, now we have a situation. There are rockets being shot from Gaza Absolutely. to Israel, right? You don't. Know, somebody knows about it, or is it in NPR? Did you hear about it? No, there's too many I did, things. They did do a story yeah, about they it. They actually did. The okay. media has been doing. They did, did, did do a good story. So then, how how do we react? Are we reacting uh, right to that, no. or are we doing the right no, things? No, we're not. Um, the the I actually I, after the flotilla events, I started um, an organization called Act for Israel, which is basically. Dealing with, I think one of the biggest problems that we have in terms of news is not actually news media as we know it, but more online world, because the flotilla exploded in the blogosphere. And the online world is what drives media today, and it's completely exposed, and we're not, as a government, investing enough time and money into it. Um, so we started this organization that deals with uh, basically information and what, what's called in the diplomacy rapid response. Um, because just to give an example of the flotilla, um, the thing happened, it was 1.20 in the morning, I was on Twitter and it was trending, Israel in Turkish was trending number four. And I was like, what the hell is going on, right? And I started looking into it and, and basically started working on Twitter. For about a week I didn't get off, didn't get out of my, didn't get off my computer. Um, we started this organization that deals with the online and online only. Um, the Israeli government, obviously, because of how the Israeli government works, which is we are we have values and we look at the facts and we don't lie to the media you know when look at the footage in, inquired into what happened took 12 hours mm -hmm. to get the details by those 12 hours you've yep, lost you lost, lost the battle your story you lost the story in this media so, age yeah so on it, that note you can't control anything but you can continue the conversation yeah. that we're having here tonight on Be Not Conversations um, because everyone has all these amazing comments and contributions and we really want to keep this dialogue going. So, I, I so we need to make my Zafdig wonderful hardcore soft power Israeli wedding. <laughs> hardcore soft power. Uh, <laughs> thank you everybody. Thanks so much for coming.